So we are on Daf Memches Amud Aleph, and we were learning about this machlokus between the Chachamim and Rishimim ben Elazar regarding whether or not when you uh, free an Evid Kanani, <coughs> and so you take him to the mikvah to make him into a Ben Chorin, the Brisa seems to indicate that he's no different from a Ger, and that just like a Ger has to be Makabal Mitzvah, he has to verbally accept to observe all commandments, so to an Evid Kanani when he's being freed has to do the same thing, otherwise it doesn't take. And the Gemara had said, well, this seems to be con- contradicted by another Brisa, which talks about the Eishe Sifas Toar. That the Eishe Sifas Toar, you're allowed to forcibly convert. So how do you reconcile it? So the Gemara now says that we have a machlokes, we have a machlokes between uh, the, uh, you know, uh, first, you know, so we have a machlok because the, the, we had another b'risa that said that an Evid Meshuchrar, when you free a slave, he doesn't have to be Makabal Mitzvah. So we said that it's a machlokus between the Chachamim and Rishim ben Olazer, who talk about this case of Eishas Yifas Torah. They talk that the Chachamim say that she has to be Makabal Mitzvah, so there's no option. Uh, in other words, so that's why she has to go through this 30-day waiting period, and it's only if she accepts mitzvahs prematurely that you don't have to finish the 30 days, you can be Magai or her whenever she's Makabal Mitzvahs. And, the, and Rabbi Shimon ben Olazer or disagrees. And he says, no, I have another way of circumventing the 30-day waiting period. Uh, just uh, make her your shivcha, make her into a slave, then take her to the mikvah, free her, and then she'll become an, a shichra, uh, a shivcha mishuchreres, she'll become a freed slave, and she'll automatically become Jewish, even without being makabal mitzvah. So you see that there's a machlokus here, whether an evid mishuchrar needs to be makabal mitzvah or not. The Gemara yesterday had told us, and this is the beginning of Daf Memches, that the reason of Reb Shimon ben Elazar is because of the Pasuk. It says, kol evid ish miknas kesef, that the slave of a man who was acquired by money Right, so you have to go through the process of circumcision and immersion in a mikvah, and then az yochalbo. Then he can partake of the carbon pesach. So the Gemara's question is, what does the word ish mean in the pasuk? Obviously, he's a slave of someone. Why do you have to call he's a slave of a man? This can't be that he's not the slave of a woman. That doesn't make any sense. So the Gemara says that the word ish is bifurcating and telling you that there are two instances. One is when he's a, an Evid, he's the son, or he's an Evid of an Ish, and in that situation he can be forcibly converted, and that's what the Pasuk is talking about, but when he's a Ben Ish, when he's not an Evid Ish, but he's a Ben Ish, meaning that he's the son of a Gentile, and he's not a slave, then he cannot be forcibly converted. That's the way Rav Shem Ben Elazar looks at the Pasuk. Now we're up to the Verabonon. Verabonon, how are they going to look at the Pasuk? They say both a uh, ger and an evid meshuchar need to be makabel mitzvah. So Amar Ula kishem shi'i atamal ben ish bal karcho kach i atamal evid ish bal karcho. So he says very simply, not based on a pasuk. It logic dictates that just like an, a, a gentile coming to convert needs to be makabel mitzvah, so too any a, any gentile, even if he's an evid who's being meshucharar, needs to be makabel mitzvah. Ve'ela haksiv kol evid ish. So what are they going to do with the extra word ish in the pasuk? What do the chachamim do with that? Ha'humi boy le lechidu shmuel do amar shmuel hamafkir avdo yatsa lecherus or yetsa lecherus vein sarach get shichur. That if a person makes all of his assets hefker, he divests himself of all holdings, including his servants. The halacha is that even without giving a writ of emancipation, his evid immediately goes free. Now, how do you know that? And what's the mechanism that indicates that? Shenamar kol evid ish miknas kesef. Because as the Torah describes an evid, it calls him the servant of a man. So evid ish velo evid isha, question mark. What does that mean? It means to tell you that only when he's the slave of a, a man and not the slave of a woman. That doesn't make any sense. Ela evid sheyesh lo rishus lo rabo alav kori evid, v'shein rishus lo rabo alav ain kori evid. But rather... Shmuel says the word Ish in the Pasuk is telling you is that he has to be subservient to a human being. If he's not subservient to a human being because his master has declared him ownerless, 
So then just the declaration of him being ownerless makes him no longer subservient and he automatically goes free. That's what the word ish is doing in the Pasuk according to the Chachamim. It's not coming to distinguish between a regular ger and an eved. It's rather coming to tell you a totally different halacha having to do with hefker. So maskef lo rav papa, emor deshamas luhu le rabbonin biyafas toar de lo shaycha b'mitzvahs. Aval eved deshaycha b'mitzvahs hachanami dafi lo rabbonin modu. So his, Rav Papa's question is, he says, you wanted to be able to clarify that the reason why there's no contradiction between uh, the two brises, one brisa that says that an Eved Meshuchrar has to be Makabal Mitzvahs, and any other brisa says an Eved Meshuchrar doesn't have to be Makabal Mitzvahs, so you wanted to try and explain that it's the Machlokas between the Chachamim and Rav Shimon ben Elazar, which is discussed by Eshes Yifas Tohar, this woman that you find on the battlefield. His argument is there's no comparison. By a woman that you find on the battlefield, she is completely from a foreign culture, she has no connection to Judaism, maybe that's only there to the Chachamim say that she has to be makabel mitzvahs in order to be considered a convert. But an Evid Kenani, who's been living under the tutelage of a Jew, right? Like you go, Ted, right? Ted, where he's been working here, he knows more about Judaism than I do because of all the things that he's been doing over the course of, of decades in this building. Would you say that he also has to be Makabal Mitzvah? I'm not, I'm, he's not an Evid, obviously, but I'm saying, but a guy who's been working for someone for years, maybe the Chachamim would be motive, that in that case he's been so inculcated with religious culture and the, the, the whole, the whole uh, religious upbringing, maybe he wouldn't have to be Mekabal Mitzvah, Eliezer with Avram, for example. The Tanya, Echad Ger, the Echad Lokech, Evid Min Haove Kochavim, Tzarech Lekabel. And I'll prove it to you. Look at this Brisa. It says whether a person is a convert, uh, uh, meaning he's converting to Judaism, or whether he is being sold from by a Gentile to a Jew, in both of those cases, he has to be Mekabal Mitzvah. But we can infer from that that halokech mi Yisrael ain't sarach lekabel. But if a slave is being sold from one Jew to another, it sounds like even though his, there's a transfer of ownership which would require him to be toivel again, he wouldn't have to be makabel mitzvahs in that case. So why is that money? Who does this price go according to? E Rebbe Shimon ben Elazar, Hamar lokech min avik chavim nami ain't sarach lekabel. It can't be Reb Shimon ben Elazar because he says no matter when you purchase a slave and from whom you purchase a slave, the Eved does not have to be makabel mitzvah when you want to free him. It shouldn't make a difference, according to Reb Shimon ben Elazar. In, neither, in, no, in no situation would he need to be makabel mitzvah. So therefore, el alav rabbanan. So it must be that this is going according to the Chachamim. Ushma mina, de lokech mina v'kochavim tzarech lekabel, ava lokech mi Yisrael ein tzarech lekabel. And what we learn from here is that regardless of, that according to the Chachamim, that it's only when he's coming from a foreign culture does he have to be makabel mitzvahs. But if he's not coming from a foreign culture, he doesn't have to be makabel mitzvahs. And therefore, if you're going to free him after he's already been inculcated with Judaism, even the Chachamim would seemingly agree that he doesn't have to be makabel mitzvah. So with the, the, our question is back. How then can our previous b'risa imply that an Evid Meshuchar has to be makabel mitzvah in order for him to be considered a Jew? So ve'elakasha echad ger ve'echad Evid Meshuchar. So the Gemara answers, kitanya hi le'inyan tefilatanya. The Gemara says, no. Really, you misread the original b'risa. The b'risa, when it says that there's no difference between a ger and an Evid Meshuchar, it was only talking about the laws of tevila in a mikvah that he, they both have to use the same mikvah, they both can't have a chatzitza, they both have to completely immerse, and then when they come out, they're considered to be a full-fledged Jew. But as far as the halacha of being makabel mitzvahs, we are not at all comparing a ger to an evid meshuchar. A ger has to be makabel mitzvahs in order for him to be a convert. An evid meshuchar does not, even according to the chachamim. Tanu Rabbana. Now let's go back to the halachas of Eishe Siyafas Toar, this woman whom you find on the battlefield and can convert to Judaism. The Torah says, V'gilcha esrosha v'asasa es tziparneha. The Torah says that there's a whole process that she must undergo before you can marry her as your wife. She has to make herself unattractive by shaving off her hair and crying for her mother and father for 30 days. And if after all of that you still want to marry her, so then the Torah gives you permission. So what's, what's interesting is that the Torah says she shall shave her hair and do her nails. 
do do her fingernails. Now, what does it mean to do her fingernails? Now it means that it makes you... Make Today, it means when you say, I'm going to do my nails, it means you're going to fancy them up, make them make them nice. But this is the other way around. So the question is, what does it mean? So Rabbi Eliezer Omer Takutz and Rabbi Akiva Omer Tagdil. Rabbi Eliezer says she should clip her nails, and Rabbi Akiva says she should grow her nails long. Now, it's important to realize that... Today, letting your, having long fingernails for a woman is considered attractive because she puts polish on them, etc. Right? But in the times of the Gemara, make, having long fingernails is considered unattractive. There was no manicurist that you could go to. They didn't have that technology. So if you had long fingernails, it was considered unattractive. So the question now is, why would Rebbe Eliezer say that she has to clip her nails? If the whole purpose is to make herself unattractive, you would think like Rebbe Akiva, that she should let her fingernails grow long. So I'm a Rebbe Eliezer, so Rebbe Eliezer tells you why. He says, Nemra asiya barosh, v'nemra asiya bitsi pornayim. Malahalan ha'avara, afkan ha'avara. He says, very simply, it says uh, some action that you're supposed to do with your hair, which is shaving the hair. The Torah says, I want you to shave her hair. And then it says to do her nails. So just like shaving is the removal of hair, so too the nails is the removal of the f- fingernails. But Rabbi Akiva Omer, no. Nemer asiyah barosh, nemer asiyah bitsiyah pronayim. Malahala nivul, afkan nivul. The Rabbi Akiva says, but think about it logically. The Torah is telling you to shave her hair so that she'll be unattractive. So if it's telling you to do something with her nails, it must be to make her unattractive as well, and therefore he wants you to let her nails grow long. And the Gemara says, <coughs> But even though there's a machlokis, we have a pasuk in Tanakh that indicates that Rebbe Eliezer is more correct, because it says in Shmuel Beis, Mephibosheth ben Shol, Yorad likras ha-melech. Mephibosheth, Shol's son, goes down to greet the king, and it says that he's in a, in a state of unkemptness. Uh, un, he's ungroomed. Lo asa raglav, velo asa safamo. He did not do his toenails, nor his mustache. So my asiya ha'avara. So you see that both times the verb is asa, and just like not doing your mustache means not trimming your mustache, so too, not doing your fingernails means not clip. His fingernails were not um, were not uh, were not clipped. So therefore, when it says she shall do her fingernails, it means to clip. You say doing is an action, and letting them grow is not doing anything. It's just the absence of doing. Well, you could make that argument, but Rabbi Akiva would still say that doing is to do something to make her look unattractive. Do something to make her look unattractive. Anyway, okay. Now, what does the Torah say? She shall cry for her mother and father for a month of days. So Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Aviha, Aviha, Mamish, Ima, Ima, Mamish. So Rabbi Eliezer says, when it says she'll cry for her father and mother, it means literally her, she wants her mommy and daddy. She misses them. But Rabbi Akiva Omer, Aviyah vi'ima zu ovedes kochavim. No, avodes kochavim. He says what it means is that crying for her father and mother means she'll cry for her older faith and culture, meaning that she's going to be missing her old religious ways of paganism. The chen hu Omer, omrim la'etz avi ata v'goymer. As it says in Yirmiyah that the, that the people were saying in his time to uh, idols, you know, made out of wood, you're my father. So, so therefore, um, or and to the stone you've given birth to me. So therefore, you see that you sometimes can call idolatry your, your culture is like your parent culture. We even say that in English today, my parent culture. So that's what that, that's what Rabbi Akiva says that she has to divest herself of by crying and rejecting it. Sometimes refer to punish sparkles. That's right, of course. Mother of none. Right? Okay, good. Keep it, keep it coming, guys. <laughs> Yerach Yamim. Okay. Yerach Yamim, uh, a month of days. So what does a month of days mean? So, Yareach Shloshim Yom. So the first shot is of the Tanakhama is that it means 30 days. She cries. But Rav Shimon ben Elazar Oimer, Tishim Yom. He says, no, it's 90 days that she has to go through this process of mourning. Why? Because Yerach is Shloshim. Yamim Ishloshim, and then the Acharkain Ishloshim. The Torah says that she shall cry thir- uh, a month of days and the Acharkain, and then afterwards you may be intimate with her. 
So he takes all three phrases. First word is yerach, which means 30 days. Then the word yamim means an additional 30 days. And then v'achar kein means an additional 30 days after that. And that's where he gets 90. So maskef lo ravina, ema yerach shloshim, yamim shloshim, v'achar kein kihani. So he says, Ravina says, well, if you're going to look at the Pasuk that way, maybe it's 120 days. Maybe it's 30 days is Yerach, Yamim is another 30 <coughs> days, and then V'achar Kain after that means an, an opposing, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, a comparable amount of time of what has already elapsed, then, which means after that, then you can be intimate, which would be another 60 days, not another 30 days. So maybe it's 120 days. So the Gemara says, you're right, Kasha, I don't have an next answer to that question. It's a good question. Tana Rabbanan, Mekayim in Avadim She'inan Molim, Diver Rabbi Yishmael. Now we have another b'risa, which is going to be the rest of our discussion today. Is it permitted, when you purchase an Evid Kanani, okay, we talked about an Evid Kanani possibly not even needing to be Makabal Mitzvahs, but what happens if he refuses to, to submit to circumcision? Okay? You see from this whole discussion, it's not like we strap him down and force him to get circumcised. We're not barbarians after all. We have to, you know, we have to treat him like a human being. Uh, so what if he says, uh, you know, I'll be happy to work for you, but, you know, there are limits to what I'm prepared to do, right? So he says, I'm not going to have a bris. So the question is, are we still allowed to keep him in our house? So Rabbi Akiva Omer ain Mekaimin. So Rabbi Akiva, uh, I'm sorry. Mekaimin Avadim Shenim Mulim Diver Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Shmuel says you can you, you can stay in your house, and Rabbi Akiva Omer ain Mekaimin. Rabbi Akiva says no, you can't keep him, and if he's not going to have a bris, you got to get rid of him. You got to sell him to a goy. So Amar Le Rabbi Shmuel Harehu Omer Viyinafesh Ben Amasecha. Rabbi Shmuel says, look, we have a pasuk which is clearly talking about an uncircumcised David, and it says that he has to rest on Shabbat. So you see that he's going to be living with you. So Rabbi Akiva says, no, that Pasuk, which talks about an uncircumcised slave, it's only a very temporary condition. You bought him on a Friday afternoon, and you didn't have a chance to do the bris, and Shabbos comes in, so the Torah is telling you that he too has to rest. But it's not telling you that you can keep him permanently in your house uncircumcised. So But it seems like both Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva agree that this Pasuk is talking about an uncircumcised slave. Where do you see in the Pasuk that he's not, that he's an Aurel, that he's uncircumcised? Ditanya, as the Brisa says, It's based on a Brisa that says explicitly that it's talking about an Aurel slave. Now, Maybe not. Maybe it's talking about a circumcised Evid. So, Kishu Omer the answer is, is because in the Ten Commandments in Parshas Vo'es Hanan, it also states that your Evid has to rest on Shabbos. So if that's talking about a regular slave, so then this Pasuk in Parshas Mishpatim is talking about a special case slave, meaning that he's an Arel, he's uncircumcised. The next part of the Pasuk says, Vehager, that the Ger shall also rest on Shabbos. Zezeg Ger Toishav. This refers to a Gentile who is observing the Noahide laws, that he too has to rest on Shabbos. Or maybe no, maybe the word ger refers to a Jewish convert. So Kishu Omer Omer Hamani So again, you have this doubleness, the, the repetition. It says already in the Ten Commandments that the ger has to rest on Shabbos. That's referring to a ger tzedek, a, a Jewish convert. So when it says ger in the Parshas Mishpatim, it's referring to a Gentile who's observing the Noahide laws, and he has to rest on Shabbos as well. Here you have a big debate between Rashi and Taisvis. Rashi says, why does a Gentile, a righteous Gentile, have to rest on Shabbos? Because violation of Shabbos is tantamount to idolatry even for a Gentile and therefore even though he's not Jewish he still has to not work on Shabbos Tosfus goes ballistic over this Rashi he says what are you talking about we, don't, we never find such a thing and not only that but the Gemara says that a ger shashavas chayiv misa a goy shashavas chayiv misa that if a Gentile observes Shabbos he's liable for the death penalty because it's a special covenant between only God and Israel so Tosfus therefore concludes it's big tzarachian on Rashi we're not, we're not going to have to put Rashi aside and say we don't understand Rashi but Tosfus says very pasha when the Torah requires a goy to rest on Shabbos means that he cannot do work for Yisrael. He's not allowed, you can't have a goy do work for you. That's what the Torah is telling you. 
Now, that's also problematic because the whole din of a, the Isser of a Goy working for you on Shabbos is only Midorabbanan. So this whole Gemara is problematic. But anyway, let's just, let's just keep that in mind. But in any event, Amar Rebbe Yoshua ben Levi, HaLokeach Ebed ben Aobi Kochavim, V'lorad Salomul, Megagal Ima Yud Beis Chodesh. Lomal, Chauzer Mochur Laovdei Kochavim. So comes along Rebbe Yeshua ben Levi, who's an, who's an Amor in Eretz Yisrael, and he tells us a halacha that, we, that doesn't seem to sync with, uh, with anybody. He says that if you have an Eved that you've purchased from a Goy, and he refuses to circumcise, so you keep him around for 12 months, you cajole him, try to convince him, and if still after 12 months he still refuses, you got to get rid of him, sell him to an Oyved Kochav. So at first glance, it would sound like he's going like Rabbi Shmuel, who says you're allowed to keep him, but Rabbi Shubin Levi says, but yeah, only up to 12 months. So Amrur Abonan Kameh Raf Papa Kaman Deloka Rabbi Akiva, Di Rabbi Akiva, Amr Ein Mekayimin. It sounds like he's not going like Rabbi Akiva, because according to Rabbi Akiva, you're not even allowed to keep him around for a day. So the Gemara says, no. Amr Luhu Raf Papa, Afilu Tema Rabbi Akiva, Hani Mili Hecha Delo Pasca Lamilse, Abal Hecha De Pasca Lamilse Pasca. So, We'll learn like the first shot in Rashi. It's that no, even this could go like Rebbe Akiva. The only time Rebbe Akiva says you got to get rid of him right away is if the guy came kicking and screaming to be your Evan and he said at the very outset, I'm not having anything to do with this Jewish stuff. You want me to work for you, fine, but don't expect me to do anything Jewish, right? But let's say when you purchase him, the Evan says, Yes, Master, I'm willing to do anything that you ask and I'll become a Jew. Don't worry and I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. And then you bring him home and you tell him, okay, uh, we just sit down on the table, we're going to do a uh, circumcision. And he says, not so fast, right? He gets cold feet, right? So in that situation, Rebbe Akiva would agree that you can wait up to 12 months. Because since he was willing to go through the process, but then he got cold feet, then you give him 12 months to try and, you know, you know, conjole him and let him, you know. So that would be the distinction. So Amar of Kahana, Amrisa Lishmaita Kameda Rav Zvidmi Naharda. So Rav Kahana says, I suggested that explanation but in front of Rav Zvid and Naharda. And Amar Li, Iachi ki Amar Le Rebbe Akiva Belokech Eved Ben Hashmashos Lishni Leha. So he says, I don't understand how you can say that. Remember, Rebbe Akiva, we asked Rebbe Akiva the question, how can you say that the Pasuk, which talks about it, how can you say that the Pasuk allows, tells you that an uncircumcised Evid has to stop working on Shabbos if you're not allowed to own an uncircumcised Evid? And what was Rebbe Akiva's answer? Because you bought him right before, uh, right before Shabbos, you didn't have time to give him a bris. You don't have to give me that answer. You could say because he's in the, the 12-month period. Why didn't you give me that answer? So the Gemara says, He could have given that answer, but he gave another answer. In other words, there are a number of scenarios where, according to Rebbe Akiva, you could have an uncircumcised male. One is you bought him right before Shabbos and there wasn't time. Or two, because he was really uh, uh, originally consenting and then he got cold feet and you gave him up to 12 months. Now, Sholach Rabin Mishmei de Rebbe Eloi, V'chol Raboisai Amr Lo Mishmo. So Rabin sends a message in the name of Rebbe Eloi and he says that all of my teachers also said in the name of Rebbe Eloi, Ezehu Eved Arel Shemutu Lekaimo, Zeh Sholach Chorabo Almanas Shalol Lamulo. He says, I'll, I'll tell you, there's actually another circumstance where you're allowed to keep an Evid in your house who's an RL. When you originally stipulated with him that he doesn't need to have a bris. In other words, he said, listen, sir, I'm willing to work for you. Are you willing to let me live as an uncircumcised uh, Evid? And as long as there was an explicit contract between the two of you that it, he doesn't need to uh, circumcise, then he's allowed to stay in your house. So, Amru Rabbanan Kameta Rav Papa, Kemandalo Rebbe Akiva. This also seems to be not like Rebbe Akiva. The Rebbe Akiva Ha'amar Ein Mekayimin. Because Rebbe Akiva had said that you're not allowed to keep an Evid around who's uncircumcised. So, Amar Luhu Rav Papa, Filu Tema Rebbe Akiva, Anemi Lehecha Delo Asni, Ba'adei. Aval Hecha De Asni, Asni. Rav Papa says, no, Rebbe Akiva might agree. The only time that you're not allowed to keep an Evid Kanani that's an Aurel in your house is when there was no original stipulation. Right? You didn't discuss anything at all. Then the, then the Halacha Rebbe Akiva says, so then you can't keep him around. But if there was a specific agreement at the outset, and it was an amicable purchase, 
and both of you had, an, uh, had a mutual understanding that he was not going to have a bris, so then you're allowed to keep him in your house indefinitely, even according to Rebbe Akiva. Are you allowed to do that with I mean, Well, that's what it seems like. It sounds what it sounds like from the Gemara, from this, at least according to this opinion. So, Amar of Kahana, Amrisa Lishmaita Kameidu Rav Zavid bin Nahar Dava, Amar Li, Yachi Kikarmale Rebbe Akiva, Belok Echa Bebe Nashmashos, Belok Zbiko Klamulo, Lishin Leha. So he so Reb Zvid raises again the same objection. If Rabbi Akiva agrees that as long as there was a gentleman's agreement in advance, he's allowed to remain in RL, why then didn't Rabbi Akiva say that that was what the Pusik was talking about when an RL can live in your house? Why did he have to say, now you're talking about an Evid that you bought right before Shabbos and there wasn't time to give him a bris? You could have given this answer. So the Gemara says, Velitamech Lishni Lehach. So according to your argument, we could have given the previous answer, where, you know, the only time that Rebbe Akiva says that you're not allowed to keep an Evid in the house is only when he went kicking and screaming. But if he, uh, but if he, if he consented originally, then you can keep him up to 12 months. So you see that Rebbe Akiva has a variety of answers that he could have given. So, Elachad Mitreyu Tlastaymi Ka'ama. So the conclusion of the Gemara is, now we have three possibilities, even according to Rebbe Akiva, how an RL can live in your house. Either because nothing was said in advance, in which case he's not allowed to live in your house unless he's circumcised. So how come the Torah talks about an uncircumcised David? Because there was no time before Shabbos. Case number two is where he actually actively agreed, expressly agreed that he was going to become a Jew and live like a Jew, and then he got cold feet. So in that situation, he's allowed to live in your house up to 12 months uh, to give him a chance to you know, uh, submit to the bris, and if he doesn't, then you got to sell him. And the third situation is that even Rabbi Akiva could potentially agree to where there was an express agreement between the Evid and the master that he's not going, he's not going for a bris. And if both parties agree in advance, so then it's perfectly fine to keep him, even according to Rabbi Akiva, indefinitely. So when a Torah says that you must uh, circumcise your slaves, it means only according to this opinion, only with their consent? Is that how we're saying? No, it's only if you want them to participate in the carbon Pesach. Uh-huh. The Torah only says that in order for your Evid to eat the carbon Pesach, he has to circumcise. There's no mitzvah say to circumcise your slaves. So then when it said that, it was talking about carbon Pesach. It's talking about carbon Pesach. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. Now, Let's go on. Yosef Rabbi Chanina Bar Papi Rabbi Ami Rabbi Yitzchak Navcha Akilo de Rabbi Yitzchak Navcha the Yasvi Uka Ami. So these rabbis were sitting by the threshold of Rabbi Yitzchak Navcha, studying and learning, and they said as follows: Ir Echas Haisa Beretz Yisrael V'Loratzu Avadeh Halamol V'Gilgalu Imoy Machtei Masar Chodesh V'Chazru Umachim LaOvdei Kochavim. There was a city in Eretz Yisrael where there were few few uh, Jews owned slaves. <coughs> And they tried to work with them, but they still refused. And uh, after 12 months, they had to end up selling them to Goyim. Kiman ki haitana titania halokech evid min haovik kochavim v'loratz alamu megalgal imo atshnei asar chodesh lo mal chazer mocher la ovdei kochavim. It goes like the brisa that we learned before, that if uh, you purchase a slave and he refuses to have a bris, you 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 are patient with him, and try to cajole him for 12 months, and if still he doesn't want to, so then you got to sell him. So Shimon ben Elazar Omer ain mashin oso beretz Yisrael. Mipnei Hefzitah. So Shimon ben Elazar agrees because he uh, d- he disagrees. He says that if you're living in Eretz Yisrael, then you don't have that 12-month waiting period. He says you've got to get rid of him right away. And the reason is because of Taharos. When you live in Eretz Yisrael, there are many sacrificial items that may be in your house. And if you have an uncircumcised Gentile in your house, he will immediately <coughs> render everything that he touches tummy. Because Chazal where goes there that an Aurel, an Aurel's touch is like the touch of a Zav. That he'll make everything a, of a, become a high level of Tumah. And that's why Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar says it's one thing to talk about in Chutzlar, that you can keep an Aurel in your house. But in Eretz Yisrael you can't. And furthermore, it's even more stringent if you live in a border town in Eretz Yisrael. In a border town, you can't even keep them for a moment in your house. And the reason is, is because we're worried about political allegiances. If he's refusing to submit to Yiddishkeit and to, and to, and to circumcise himself, then he might, have, he might be a traitor. He might be a collaborator. 
and therefore we're worried that if he he might hear, like, hey, you know, uh, tomorrow's Yom Kippur, all the Jews are going to be in synagogue, great day to attack. We don't want him to have information that he could pass on to potentially one of our enemies, and therefore you can't even keep him for a moment in your home. Tanya, Rebbe Chananya, Benoshal, Rebbe Gamliel, Omer, Bipnei Magirim, Bizman Hazem, Unin, Viyasurin, Boin Aleyin. This is a very important Gemara. It's quoted very often. Uh, the Brisa says, why is it that today converts to Judaism are afflicted with terrible suffering in life? Why does that happen? Why does it happen so often that we find that Geirim have difficult lives? So, the answer is, is because when they were Goyim, before they converted, they did not fulfill the, all of the Sheva Mitzvah Spinei Noach, so they're getting their punishment now. So, like Rashi points out, he says, if they would have remained Goyim, God would not necessarily have afflicted them in this life. He would have uh, saved their punishment for the afterlife. But now that they've converted to Judaism, God wants to clear the slate in the afterlife, so he'll bring them their punishment in this life kindness, no, right. as a kindness, right? So Rabbi Yossi Omer Gershon Iskar Kekach and Shanola Rabbi Yossi disagrees. He says that's not the reason because when a person converts to Judaism, they become like a newborn human being. They're total. They're like they're like a they're like a totally different person. So what happens? So what what whatever life they lived as a as a goy is not they're not punishable for. So that can't be the reason. But rather, he has a different theory. His theory is that the reason why Gerim suffer in life is because they're, since they're, they, they're not as educated, they're invariably going to err in their observance of halacha. And because of that, Hashem is going to punish them. So, Abba Hanan Omer, Mishum Rabbi Elazar, Lefishain Osin Me'ahava Ela Me'ira. And he says a different opinion in the name of Rebbe Lazar. He says, no, Gerim convert today in the Talmudic times only out of fear, not because of love of Hashem. They have to understand that that was in the times of the Gemara. That doesn't necessarily apply today. In the times of the Gemara, why would a person ever convert to Judaism? I mean, it was such a such a, a non... It didn't make any sense. You'd have to say that they had studied Judaism and realized that if I don't convert to Judaism, God's going to bring retribution. That must have been their belief. Otherwise, it didn't make sense for them to convert. So therefore, because they convert out of fear more than out of love, that's why uh, Hashem treats them uh, in a punishing way, because their, their level of observance is not as great as a pious Jew. And And other rabbis say, no, the real reason is, is because why did it take you so long to finally realize that you had to be Megayer? In other words, we know that people who are Megayer, really their neshamas were at Har Sinai the whole time, right? So if that's the case, why did you wait till you were 40 years old before you decided to be Megayer? Where were you for the last 20 years? What took you so long? And that's why Hashem takes them to task, because you should have realized this earlier on. How are they different than both Shubas? Yes, that was what you meant. Okay. Apparently, the, the, the holier the potential, mm-hmm. right, when you transform from something completely goyish to something y- Yiddish, that shows that there was an amazing transformation. If there was such an amazing transformation that needed to take place, it should have taken place earlier. So that's why Chaval on those years that the transformation <laughs> didn't take place. Why, why, does the Gemara's, why are they going on to this thing about, well, it's the old question, why did that bad thing happen to good people? You know, so why do we... We don't speculate most of the time. We say the Gemara does theologically speculate all the time. The Gemara does ask why do bad things happen to good people. The Gemara is making an observation, and I have to tell you, being in this business for a number of years, I can also tell you there's a dis- disproportionate number of Gerim that I've worked with personally that have had difficulty in their lives more so than other people that I've known. Just you know, just going through different traumas and different dramatic experiences, whether it's Parnassa, children, you know, all of these different things, relationships, and it just seems to be so unfair. You said yourself, because look, this person Nebuch, they committed themselves to become a Jew, and and look at the selflessness and the and the altruism and the and the integrity of this person. Why is they suffering? And that's what Chazal are bothered with. They're saying, look, these are these are good people. Why then would they have to suffer more so than others? And they were warned. And they were warned. And could one say it's testing the sincerity that they could, are they able to withstand the tribulations? Why, that God, would, that God would subject them to this? The Gemara doesn't suggest that because the Gemara says that uh, the very fact that they've gone, made this commitment should be sufficient, but maybe, maybe you're right, I don't know. 
Amar Rebbe Yavo, Vitema Rebbe Chanina Maikra. What's the Pasuk to support the Acherim's contention that it's because they took too long to come to Gerus that they have to suffer sometimes? Because it says that when that when Boaz spoke to Rus to bless her, he said, Yeshalem Hashem Pa'alech, Usihi Maskortech Shalema Me'im Hashem Eloke Yisrael, that God should pay you back and give you full reward from Hashem. That why? Asher Ba'as Lachsos Begoma, because you came right away to convert and come under the wings of the divine presence. So the implication of Boaz is, is that you will not have any of your reward subtracted because you came immediately at the first available opportunity to convert to Judaism. The implication is that if you had taken your time and tarried, then Hashem would not be as happy and you would not get full reward. Hmm. So we should all be zochet to see lots of uh, gayrim attach themselves to the Jewish people and have wonderful lives.